providing a narrative that revolves around historical and fictional accounts of commensality, and simultaneously a social experience in which the actual participants of the feast can take part and also recognize themselves um, as part of the narrative that is being recited. Commensal practices evolve in the ancient Greek world with innovations. One is the introduction of reclining on couches instead of sitting, thereby limiting the number of participants to the number of couches arranged in a sympotic space, usually up to 30 participants. Another innovation is the separation introduced between subsequent parts of the feast, the eating, the deipnon, and the drinking, the symposium. It is the symposium, the drinking, that develops into ritualistic form, involving poetry, music, luxury, entertainment, sexual courtship, and politics. As Murray argues, the aristocratic fraction, factionalism of the symposium defines it as an exclusive organization devoted to maintaining the dominance of a social class over the wider world of the polis. These exclusively male and privileged societies, reinforced by practices of commensality, often involve a pledge that intensifies the internal bonds of the group and distinguishes it from the community at large. The Greek symposium has been widely studied as a site of generally male commensality. If respectable women were generally excluded from symposia, this did not imply that they didn't have occasions to attend banquets of their own. As Joan Burton carefully demonstrates, women had their own venues in certain religious festivals and did at times participate in male-dominated gatherings. Wedding feasts, commemoratory and sacrificial festivals were occasions where women and men participated together. Burton argues, in the ancient Greek world, where women were typically denied such modes of self-expression as voting in civic elections or serving on juries, women's religious festivals and celebrations provided important opportunities, both formal and informal, for women to establish a sense of self-identity and community. And feasting and drinking together played a significant role in these processes of socialization. However, it is in the classical period that commensality gains a more public and central meaning. While aristocratic commensal practices and private feasts continue with a strong elitist and even conspiratorial flavor, the creation of a common hearth symbolizing the eternal fire of the polis in the chief magistrate's office signifies an important benchmark. The institution is aristocratic, argues Murray. The ritual does not involve communal or even representative dining, but the honorific dining of an elite. Dining at the Pyrtaneion is indeed the highest honor that the democratic city can bestow, and it's an honor to which no ordinary member of the demos can aspire. In this light, we may recall Socrates' defiant comment, full of irony, in the Apology, after he declares to the polis his intention to disobey a ban on philosophy if it were the condition of his acquittal, suggesting that he will defend his practice of philosophy with his life. Socrates reveals his staunch refusal to appeal to the court and his unwillingness to persuade his fellow citizens for a penalty lesser than death, when he suggests as a counter-proposal for his punishment that he deserves free meals in the Pyrtaneum. Not only does he refuse being criminalized by the instrumentalization of the law and rejects this imprisonment as a form of slavery to those in power, but he goes further, reversing the terms of punishment to an acknowledgement of his public service and suggests an entitlement to public commensality. Of course, the right to dine at the Pyrtaneum was restricted to certain select persons, envoys, Olympic victors, and priests, indicating the presence of a group of elites 
and the continuing salience of aristocratic values even within a democratic setting. Murray points out these persons were also referred to as parasitoi, <coughs> indicating the negative public perception of those on public business dining at public cost. At the same time, the most democratic version of commensality also corresponds to this period. First, in the communal practices associated with the members of the council, the pirtanais, chosen by lot, who were provided with their own kitchen and food allowance of one obol per day. In comparison to those who ate at the pirtaneon, the pirtanais ate at the tholos, comparable to a staff lunchroom. Several differences mark this group of, from the diners of the initial group. First, they are much more diverse in terms of class composition because they are selected by lot. Second, their food is procured by state allowance. And third, they eat their food without reclining, which had become by that point a distinctively elite practice prevalent in private symposia. They ate together as a closed group for approximately 35 to 40 days. Other occasions for largely egalitarian commensal practices were the religious festivals. In these events, the city, and especially the wealthy members of each clan, were responsible for providing the food, especially uh, as a means to engage in conspicuous spending. Religious groups organized around differing deities also organized communal meals following their sacrifices. Another interesting version was the Iranos, originally a feast organized on the principle of shared contributions. It soon developed into an important institution for mutual help, lending money to members without interest, and was often centered on a cult and involved communal feasting. The philosophical circles that developed into schools also relied heavily on commensal practices as an indication of a common life and occasions for intellectual discussion. Overall, commensal practices seem to have diffused into a wide geography stretching from Macedonia to India. A significant form of commensality in this context was that of the Spartans, known as Sisitia. Scholars argue that while Spartan commensality may have had its roots in the symposium, demonstrable by the prevalence of reclining and the two-part structure separating eating and drinking, it is also considered to be a radical innovation. This is because Spartan commensality was heavily communal and corresponded both to the extension of citizenship to all adult males the institutionalization of militarism, and the inculcation of the virtues of a public life through sociality. The commensal practices of the Spartans were characterized by equality and austerity. Once a male reached adulthood, he would be elected into a warrior guild. The hoplite warriors practiced daily commensality, based, however, on the mandatory contribution of every citizen to pay his due to support it. The inability or unwillingness to pay had serious consequences, including the loss of membership to the Cistitian or and political rights. Hodgkinson contends the radical nature of the transformation in the Spartan commensality involved the extension of the messes into uh, the entire social body, their relocation to the public space of the Hyakinthian way and the linkage of compulsory monthly contributions to the retention of citizenship, each a reflection of the extension of state control over the sphere of male commensality. In contrast to the Spartan model, for example, the Cretan form of commensality placed the burden of providing food to the public coffers. Cretan commensality was both military and masculine, with a focus on the discussion of public and military affairs, and a strict separation from outsiders who were designated to sit at a stranger's table. Commensal practices made their way into philosophy through Plato's Republic. In Book 5 of The Republic, 
As Plato describes the life he envisions for the city's guardians, he emphasizes certain features, such as the abolition of private property, marriage and the family, equal education and activities for men and women, among other things, pertaining to the organization of a communal life. An important aspect of this life is that the meals will be eaten in common at mess tables. These elements serve, according to Plato, the cultivation of a, quote, community of feeling in pleasure and pain that bind the citizens together when they all, so far as it is possible, rejoice and grieve alike at the events that affect the city and its inhabitants. Now, all of the rest of the inhabitants, of course, are there to provide the conditions of possibility of the communal existence of the guardians. The harmonious maintenance of the city, according to Plato, requires a strong unity, and the latter depends on the unity of the ruling class. If this goal involves the inculcation of discipline through the authoritative regulation of the class of guardians, including the regulation of their sexual practices, its main vector passes through the elimination of mine and thine. <coughs> While the most striking and scandalous, scandalous at least to Aristotle, measure Plato proposes is the holding of children and wives in common, its everyday basis is the sharing of food around a common table. Similarly, in the laws, Plato makes several references to the common messes of both the Cretan and Spartan varieties, registering their significance for the organization of the lives of citizenry both personally and publicly. Plato makes clear that he is endorsing already existing practices of commensality, so his prop proposition reflects the spirit of his times, the public spirit of his times. At the same time, for the non-imaginary republics, Plato proposes the idea that each citizen should contribute his or her own share thereby making the citizenry responsible for the micro-regulation of their common messes. True, he assigns a supervisor for each group, but the extent of the supervisory function is not clear. He famously makes an argument for the necessity of common meals not only for women, but not only for men, but also for women. Again, a scandalous proposition for his time, strengthening the case for Plato as an early feminist thinker. Plato's encouragement of common meals reveals the idea that the everyday lives of citizens is a public concern, and that the collective regulation of meals by the city is a crucial building block that fosters the equality of its members, an equality that develops through commonality and into solidarity. I hope that the contrast that Plato's thought presents with Arendt's depiction of the strict separation of the private and the public in the ancient world is clear enough. On the other hand, Aristotle provides a more critical espousal of the common messes in comparison to Plato. While he argues for common meals, Aristotle suggests that they should be paid for by the city rather than by individual contributions. Quote, but the common meals must be shared, he says, by all the citizens, and it is not easy for the poor to contribute their quota of the cost from their own resources and also to maintain their household as well. 